Um, so this is um, my friend and colleague, Andrea. We were postdocs together at the Broad Institute, uh, but now she's a senior expert in data science <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, at Novartis, um, doing work on um, therapeutics. Uh, she got a PhD at UNC Chapel Hill in bio bioinformatics or biostatistics? Biostatistics. Biostatistics. <laughs> and so she's um, our, our resident um, biology genetics expert, and so she's going to give us a handful of lectures now um, on all the biology that we should understand for the work that we do. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick, and I'm really delighted to be back at the Russell Sage Foundation uh, Summer Institute for Social Science Genomics. Uh, as Patrick said, I'm Andrea. This lecture is scheduled to be 90 minutes. Uh, so at any point, if you have questions or comments or you want to chime in with anything, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I will not be offended or, or irritated. And also, I should probably give the disclaimer that I am not as much of a biologist as some people in the world. Uh, and so some of your questions I may have to say, you're going to need to talk to a chemist about that, or I don't know the answer, but this is my vague understanding of it. Uh, so with that, I'll kick things off. Um, so this first lecture before lunch, we're going to talk about some, oh, did, was there an issue? OK. Um, we're going to talk about some basics of biology. Uh, if you have not seen biology since your high school or early undergraduate days, this will probably look familiar, but maybe you could use a little bit of refreshing. If you're biologically inclined, this will all be fairly old news. We're going to talk about what a cell is. We'll talk about what is DNA on a molecular level. We'll take a quick look at the structure of the human genome, just what do we mean when we talk about chromosomes, base pair positions, what that sort of thing entails. Then we'll go through something called the central dogma of biology, which is by no means all-encompassing, but it is super useful in understanding the way biologists have thought about genetics and DNA, uh, especially historically, and then we'll get into variation and the way biologists think about genetic variation. So the first question is, what is a cell here? Um, animals, plants, fungi, proteins, and bacteria are all made up of cells. Organisms can consist of one cell, or they can consist of many cells. So in multi-celled organisms, we the cells provide structure to the body. They take in nutrients from food. They convert those nutrients into energy. And they can carry out specialized functions. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means exactly. So animal cells, we, we count as animals. Um, measure between 1 and 100 micrometers across. It's quite small. Um, and humans have an estimated 40 trillion cells each. So we are talking about things that are quite small. Uh, just to give us an idea here, um, obviously our bodies are organized into organs, each with a predefined function. And each of these organs is made up of different types of cells, sometimes multiple types of cells within a, one organ, and sometimes a, a single or a relatively small amount of cells in each organ. So this is just um, a picture showing stem cells, uh, which all cells start off as differentiating into various different types of cells. And this will become relevant as we start talking about DNA and its role inside of cells. Cellular machinery is largely similar across species and cell types. You've probably seen a cartoon like this in a high school biology class, um, perhaps more recently, where we have these sort of various colored blobs that indicate organelles or subcomponents of the cell that have different functions. We're not going to talk about all of these. Um, we're mainly going to talk about the nucleus, which is where the vast majority of the DNA is located. There are small amounts of DNA in the mitochondria. Uh, we had mitochondrial Eve on our uh, trivia mm -hmm. during our icebreaker. The mitochondria are maternally inherited, uh, and these do actually have small amounts of DNA in them. Uh, and so there is a, that's the one exception to all the DNA lives in the nucleus. Uh, when we take all the DNA together, that's what we call the genome. So what is DNA? This is also a question on the icebreaker trivia. Uh, we had deoxyribonucleic acid, D-N, kind of in the middle of the word, A. Um, 
It's composed of monomers, so these are single units. They're not single atoms, but they are kind of single units that have a standard structure across all of DNA. Uh, and this consists of a sugar and a base. So this deoxyribose sugar is where the deoxyribose piece comes from, and that stays constant, but this base piece hanging off the end changes. So there are four possible bases. I'm sure we all know this at this point. Um, this was also a question on our icebreaker <laughs> trivia, was to name them. Uh, and so they're named here, always abbreviated A, G, T, and C. Uh, and they can be linked together in any combination of sequences in a chain like this. Um, a molecular biologist would call this the phosphate backbone because it's the means by which these things are linked together. Uh, we're not usually super consider, uh, super worried about that, but just note that the, the common piece is the piece that's linking the nucleotides together in the chain uh, and not the A, G, T, and C part. Um, so the sequence encodes the information in DNA. Um, represented here is a single strand of DNA. This is not chemically stable. You don't see single-stranded DNA in nature super frequently. Um, and if it does exist, it is quickly double-stranded or destroyed. Uh, so the bases easily form covalent bonds with, new, with nearby molecules, specifically other bases. And so this is how you end up with that sort of double-stranded idea of DNA. Um, so we have one strand here and one strand here. And A and T always pair together, and G and C always pair together. So the information contained in this strand and the information contained in this strand are completely equivalent. They've just been reversed and transposed, uh, is the way uh, statistical geneticists talk about it. So when we're discussing sequence, we generally read from the five prime end of the molecule and we read in the three prime direction. This has to do with the, the chemistry of the molecules and most molecular machinery will also be read in this direction. It'll start, if it's reading this strand, it'll start here and go this way. Um, note that the complementary sequences go in the opposite directions. So this strand goes five prime to three prime this way and this strand goes five prime to three prime the other way. Um, so when we are talking about this, it is important to keep track of which strand you are talking about. It's very easy to get mixed around that way. So if we have DNA like this, um, this is just a cartoon. This is to illustrate to us how these base pairs pair up with each other. Um, in nature, the chemical structure of these molecules leads it to form this double helix. This is a better 3D cartoon, um, suggesting sort of how this all, all winds up. And, and you can see it coils up in this double helix structure. And here, this is meant to show us um, the pairing of T with A and C with G. So um, the sequence of A, G, C, and T encodes information. We talked about that already. I think it's, it's super useful here to remember that DNA in every cell of an organism encodes the same-ish. There's a, a little bit of a proviso there, but the same information by and large. Um, so we have an estimated 3 billion bases of DNA in each cell, and each cell contains a full blueprint for the human. Again, occasionally that's not true, but it's super occasional. Um, Inside the nucleus, the DNA is organized and tightly packaged. So this conserves space without loss of information, um, and it avoids breaks and tangles. And we'll talk a little bit about how the DNA is coiled up and packaged, uh, though there are definitely scientific discoveries to be made in this space as well. So we have DNA. This is two nanometers across. Um, it's very long in its double helix. We then have these proteins called nucleosomes, which the DNA wraps around, um, kind of creating these little bundles. And then these bundles themselves coil into a fatter coil that's about 30 nanometers in width. Um, and this coil DNA is called chromatin commonly. And then the chromatin can be further packaged or, uh, or released from the structure. All right. So um, this continuous 
packaged chromatin constitutes a chromosome. I think most of us know that humans have 23 chromosome pairs. Uh, most animals have several chromosomes, each containing different information. So additional molecules can attach themselves to the DNA, causing the coiling to be tighter or looser. So methyl groups is a really common uh, example. This is what we're studying. This is what we're measuring directly when we're measuring epigenomics in most assays. So tighter coiling will almost always lead to less, less access of the molecular machinery to the DNA, which means you're going to have less activity in those areas of the genome. So what that looks like on a chemical structure level is if this is a cytosine. Cytosines are the ones that get uh, methylated that instead of this hydrogen here, you end up with a methyl group, which is a carbon and three hydrogens, makes it bulkier, and bigger, and kind of all sticks together. Um, so this is more on just kind of the organization and getting a, a lay of the land. Uh, so the chromosome is a continuous piece of DNA. We talked about that. Bacteria generally only have one chromosome, and it's in a circle, which is not how humans work. Um, <laughs> chromosome si sizes can really vary greatly. Um, fun fact, the mitochondrial chromosome is also a, a circle. Um, so bacteria are generally haploid, meaning they carry just one set of their genetic information around. They have one chromosome. Um, but that gets us into ploidy. So the number of sets of chromosomes in a cell or in all the cells of an organism, depending on what we're talking about, um, is referred to as the ploidy. So this is the number of copies of basically the same information that we carry around with us. Most animals are diploid, meaning they carry two sets of their chromosomes. Obviously, as we've been talking about inheritance and we've been talking about parental effects, you can probably deduce that we carry around one set of chromosomes from our mother and one from our father. Uh, so as an organism with more than two sets of chromosomes, it's called polyploid. Uh, and there are some fun examples here. Most of them are, all of these are plants. So apples are triploid. Wheat's, wheat is hexaploid, and strawberries are octoploid, which I thought was pretty cool. Question? Yeah, go ahead. How, if, if the sex we are producing, how do you end up with an odd number of copies of chromosomes? Do you know that? Hmm. I don't know in the case of apples, but I'm going to have to tag in a plant geneticist for that one. Okay. Um, yeah, I know uh, strawberries and wheat, and I think pine trees as well. They just carry around like several, like more generations back, and then they recombine less frequently. So humans, fortunately, do not have three sets of chromosomes. We have two, which is much easier to deal with, um, which makes us diploid as are most animals, including all the mammals. Uh, we have 22 autosomes. These are chromosomes one through 22, and they have roughly the same structure in all humans, and then we have one pair of sex chromosomes, uh, which are referred to as X and Y. And so this is what we call a karyotype. This is um, when we chemically get each of the chromosomes kind of all bound up and then stain them based on how densely packed the DNA is. Uh, and this is all the chromosomes in order. They're in order roughly by size. This is somewhat confusing when you actually look at the data because size does not always indicate gene richness. So chromosome 21, for example, is very gene rich. There's a lot going on on chromosome 21, even though it is relatively small. Um, or sorry, 19. 19 is the deceptively big one. 21 is actually really sparse. Um, it has almost nothing going on, but visually, they look like they're almost the same size. But I digress. Uh, the, the point of this slide is to show Females have two X chromosomes, and this is really plainly evident on something as simple as a karyotype. Um, and males have one X and one Y. Yeah? I've been cutting through a hexatomia. So, so with telomeres, are they the same size on an H chromosome? That's a great question. I couldn't swear to the answer to that. Uh, my understanding of telomeres, so, so just to clarify for everyone, um, telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes on both sides. Um, and as the DNA copies itself, sometimes these ends can, can get miscopied or can get shortened, uh, which is why they're often very interesting to us. But 
My understanding is that they're repetitive regions and that the sequences are not necessarily the same across chromosomes. And so if I were to bet, I would bet they're not the same length. So what is a gene? This is actually super related to Juan's question as well, that um, you know, how we define things like centromeres and telomeres also has to do with what we mean when we say a gene. Uh, so obviously the sequence of A's, G's, C's, and T's encodes the information. The, cell, the information in every cell is mostly the same. I'll explain this asterisk in this lecture, I promise. Um, and a gene is a biological unit of information with a specific structure. In particular, the gene is defined as a sequence of DNA that encodes one polypeptide or a single protein. So the DNA by itself is not capable of doing a whole heck of a lot biologically, but proteins are more the movers and shakers of biology. Um, that's not strictly true, but in general, that is generally true. So the central dogma of biology is what describes this process of going from DNA all the way to protein, um, which again, historically we've thought of as, as kind of the molecular machines that drive biological function. So vi put very simply, um, the central dogma of biology is we go from DNA to RNA to protein. DNA is the blueprint, RNA is the message, protein is the machine that actually gets stuff done. Um, so as we go through this, I'll add a little outline under each of these explaining kind of the key differences and the key information for each of these. Mm -hmm. So as we already talked about, these are identical in every cell, double-stranded, uh, primarily in the nucleus, and super stable. So transcription is the process where, but, oh, yes. Quick question on uh, sex chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like an X or a Y chromosome, does that in include every information on every trait? Because I was uh, saying that like, you have 23 mm -hmm. pairs, right? So each chromosome having like, responsible for different genes. Uh, but if, if some information or gene is missing like, in like sex chromosome, how does that break? Okay. I'm, I'm going to say some things, and if I don't answer your question, <laughs> let me know, because um, I think there, there's a couple of things in here. So um, X chromosomes in females work pretty much the same way the autosome, in, that they do in the autosomes, but in males, obviously, the X chromosome is much longer, and the Y chromosome is quite short. Um, so something to know, when these guys pair up, um, they're actually very homologous, which means they're very similar in sequence on one arm. I think it's the short or arm of Y. You can't really see it well in this picture, but it's this little blurb on the top. Um, and so that's kind of how they pair up. And so there is redundant information on X and Y um, on one arm. And then there are some X specific and some Y specific things on the other arm. Uh, and many of these encode for things that you might think would be responsible for sex differences. There's something relating, related to testosterone on the Y. The Y is, doesn't have a whole lot of, of protein coding genes other than in that homologous region. Um, but yeah, so, so they're sort of similar, but different enough to account for some obvious sex differences. Does that address your question? Ah, okay. So information in autosomal chromosome is included in the sex chromosome, right? Oh, I see. Otherwise, like when, like, across generations, when information is passed from one to the, to the next, you... Okay. Uh, so, generationally, we actually pass down all of these, not just the sex chromosomes. And we'll talk about how that works in a second. Yeah, they're one by themselves. Yeah, so when they combine, right? Yep. The X's and the Y's are combined. They're paired, but they're not combined. 
Yeah. So I, I think the, the mistake you're probably making is that when, when the two cells combine, you have the 23 pairs from the male and the 23 pairs from the female. It's not that they're just passing the sex chromosomes, if I'm understanding you correctly. Okay. Yeah, so like information that would be on the autosomes would be there from both the male and the female. Okay. And so you're not having a loss of information. So the gametes actually have like all the 23. Yeah. Every yes. cell in the body has 23 Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and specifically, and we'll talk about gamete formation specifically, that, that you're getting one copy. So you're not getting 23 full pairs from each parent. You're getting half a pair from mom and half a pair of, of, from dad of all of these, not just the sex chromosomes. Yep. Are we good? Sweet. OK, go ahead, Patrick. My question from, uh, from Moline. Um, but you said two, two haplotypes um, that are inherited from different parents are not necessarily the same size because of errors in copying. What happens when such haplotypes are paired? That's a great question. Yeah, so um, we're not going to talk about that explicitly when we talk about meiosis. But my understanding is that the chromosome pairing really just has to do with tying the two centromeres together. So if we're talking about chromos chromosome 6, and you have two copies of chromosome 6, and say there's a CNV, on one of the arms of chromosome 6, and dad has 25 copies, and mom only has two. Um, and so they're slightly different lengths. Um, they don't have to match up perfectly. They just kind of have to be able to be tied together in the middle um, to count as the same chromosome. Hopefully that addresses the question. And if not, uh, shoot me another message. OK, so we talked about what a gene is. Um, so think we were talking about transcription, which is this process of going from DNA to RNA. Transcription is um, the process by which we turn DNA into RNA so it can be used. So this is often called the message or the messenger RNA. There are other kinds of RNA, but I'm mostly going to talk about messenger RNA. Um, so like DNA, RNA encodes information in four bases. Um, we have adenosine, cytosine, guanine, and then uracil. So through the miracle of biology. Uh, tyrosine doesn't exist in RNA. We have uracil instead, which is a very related molecule, and it conveys information the same way. So this is a, a big complicated cartoon. It basically shows an RNA pol polymerase sitting on top of the double-stranded DNA. That's this purple spiral here. Uh, and it's reading, so it's reading this strand. So it's reading from the five prime end to the, to the three prime end, so that way. Um, and it's initiated on RNA, a uh, messenger RNA molecule here. Um, and it's reading along, and it's copying the information. I just told you this backwards. It's on this strand, and it's going that way. Um, this is the finished mRNA molecule. Uh, and this is where the additional nucleotides are being added. So this is that same complementary base pairing um, where this thing is kind of like a zipper. It's just chugging along, um, reading each base, and then the complementary molecule is chemically favorable to pop in. Cool? OK. Um, so RNA polymerase extends the RNA molecule just one base at a time, matching bases from the template strand just the way the DNA batch bases match. So yeah? I just one of the really is something you said. I, I had never realized that pairing was actually, like, I just assumed they were all just kind of in there. But like, they actually are tied together, like, while they're in the nucleus? Like, if, like Oh, no, that, that's only during cell division. They're all just kind of in there when the cell is just functioning. If the cell is dividing, oh, yeah, then, they need to then, then they need to squish up. Okay, okay. Yeah. so then, then things like, uh, you know, during transcription and stuff like that, like pairing is, 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 isn't relevant at those times because it's just about copying. Right, right. And I, I think it's very easy to, like everybody knows this in theory, but I think it's, it's easy to conflate this kind of matching with matching the copy of the chromosome from mom and the copy of chromosome from dad. They don't do this kind of matching. You have a double, double helix from each. Um, Again, I think everybody knows that conceptually, but sometimes it's, I think it's quite easy to get your wires crossed. Okay, so just, I'm, I'm just trying to, so um, 
Yes, what uh, Moeen was asking again about then, you know, if, if they're different lengths, then mm -hmm. for transcription, it, it shouldn't shouldn't matter because they're they're totally independent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like copy one of chromosome six and copy two of chromosome six are getting transcribed and going about their biological business completely independently. Um, at this level. <laughs> so, um, at expression level, so this is how much mRNA is highly variable across time points, cell types, and cell states. So cell state, it refers to whether or not the cell is dividing and, and in what stage is it in reproducing itself. Um, the cell types, this is blood cells, liver cells, brain cells, what type of brain cell, brain cells are very diverse. Um, and also across time, so across development um, in the life of the cell, but also in the life of the organism. Uh, and so this stage is highly variable and starts leading to all of the differences in the different types of cells that we see, but also in the different functions they can perform. So this is often mediated uh, by a very com complex system that is poorly understood to say uh, to say the least, uh, but it is definitely mediated by chromatin states, so that's how tightly packed the DNA is, the sequence context, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works, um, transcription factors, these are proteins that specifically work to enhance or, or silence the expression of a particular transcript or a family of transcripts, um, and then other known unknown factors, and we'll see this a lot as the last bullet. Yeah, Grant. This is sort of related to something you talked about in the very beginning, but yeah. Like I guess I find it a bit unintuitive that adding a methyl group um, would, would uh, tighten the coil if mm -hmm. it's getting bulkier. Like it's, it's a chemical reaction okay. that, that it, it wants to stick together as opposed to wanting to spread out. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about epigenomics, but again, uh, what I'm going to present here is, is about my, the depth of my understanding of it. Um, there are certainly molecular biology and chemistry folks that understand it much, much deeper. Okay, so um, this last bullet here is uh, about something called splicing, which we'll get into. Um, so a single gene can encode several different transcript variants or isoforms, and this is yet another source of variation in this, um, in this whole idea of transcription, going from DNA to RNA, uh, and this is also what I work on in my research. So I get very excited about talking about splicing, even though it is a small slice of this lecture. Um, all right, we get to talk about splicing now. Um, so uh, we're, the way this is often represented is, even though in the cell it's, it's very coiled and it definitely has a 3D structure, we represent the, the reading of the information as a straight line, the straight line being the DNA sequence in the direction of coding. Um, and this is often how you'll see a gene. I really wish I could turn my email off, but my computer won't let me. Um, we see it, kind of the canonical structure of a gene where these boxes are not, they're not representing anything three-dimensional. So the exons are not bigger or fatter or anything. This is just a, an informational sort of cartoon representation where exon one is this blue chunk and then there's an intron between it and the next one, exon two, exon three, exon four. And the exons um, are the bits that we want to keep, the introns, are the bits that are going to get discarded. They're going to get spliced out. Um, the naming is a little bit counterintuitive. I don't know the story behind that. Uh, so the exons are the continuous segments of sequence that are preserved in the mature transcript, and the introns are the continuous segments of sequence that are not preserved. So the way this works biologically is actually each intron is spliced out, and the exons are just the bits that are left over. Uh, the combination of exons that you end up with in a transcript are called the splice isoform or the transcript. You'll often see like transcript ID in annotations that's referring to which version of the transcript you got. So this is a cartoon of splicing. I'm not going to talk about all the chemical details of this in, in gory detail, but um, as I was saying, there, there's a sequence somewhere at the end of the nth exon somewhere at the beginning of the n plus one exon. Uh, and then there's another, uh, another sequence that's required sort of close, but in the intron called the branch point or the branch sequence. Um, and this very complicated set of proteins um, called the spliceosome needs to bind to all three of these locations. Um, then 
in the SNRP complex, what ends up happening is that this bit and this bit get joined together, and this little piece floats off. Um, <laughs> this is how it ends up looking in this cartoon. Um, and then you end up with just the, the rectangles kind of, kind of spliced together. Um, this loop structure is often called a lariat, um, and definitely borrowed this, this lovely graphic from a transit genetics paper. Um, so splicing different combinations of exons together can produce different transcripts. Um, exon boundaries are not the same in every transcript. This I learned by working on the data and was very frustrated <laughs> until I got somewhat used to it. Um, and splicing is mediated by a lot of things, including splicing context, other molecules, so splicing factors, like the factors that we showed on this side, but there are additional ones as well, and then other unknown factors again. Uh, so this cartoon is just meant to show you that you could have splicing straight through where all the annotated exons are included. Grant? Sorry, I was going to ask if SNP hits that we would typically see in GWAS can also regulate. Uh, they sure can. Yeah. That's a great question. So it, it's relatively rare. Most SNP hits, at least in my understanding, end up landing in regulatory regions, which we'll only talk about super briefly. Uh, but yeah, if you get a SNP right here in that motif that regulates splicing that could absolutely mess up the function of a gene, even though it's a small change. And I think Lofty actually predicts that. Yeah. I think Lofty, the, the tool that Conrad built, actually predicts. That's one of the many mo modalities of loss of function, if, you, if you're looking at SNP prediction scores. Uh, that's we know where the splice sites are, right? We know where the common ones are. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there are rare splicing events, and the motifs aren't as conserved as we once thought. So um, we've gone from just in one step along this, this pipeline. We've gone from DNA, which is identical in every cell, um, to RNA, which varies quite widely by cell type, by state and time. Um, this is a single-stranded nucleic acid chain, so relatively it's unstable. Um, that means that these have a very limited sort of use time. Uh, the cells use them, they make protein from them, and then the cells munch them up. And so if you want something to continue to be expressed, you have to continue to make RNA. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the splicing. So do the different isoforms tend to be related to functions, like the proteins that have related functions? That's a great question. My understanding is usually, um, but not always. That's a really good question, and that's something that I'm working on on, a tang on untangling in a couple of gene cases, and at least in the cases I've worked on, that's the answer. Oh, yeah. Um, the question for the folks on Zoom was, do the different splice isoforms, so on the slide, um, do they tend to have the same function as proteins? Uh, and the answer is sometimes. All right, so now we get into proteins. Um, and as a self-identifying computational biologist, protein is usually where my mind gets full and I maybe declare that all is lost um, because proteins are much more complicated uh, than DNA and RNA, uh, largely because this is where the rubber hits the road in a lot of cases. This, these are, can be thought of as tiny molecular machines sort of running around a cell and performing functions, whether it's uh, processing a molecule or sending something outside of the cell. Um, so the process by which we make proteins is called translation. It's the process by which the information in mRNA is translated into an amino acid chain. Um, and so that's a picture of this. This guy is the ribosome. Uh, and this is where you get codons and, and like reading frame and all of that. Um, so again, we're reading from the five prime side of the mRNA to the three prime side. Um, and we're reading three bases at a time to build an amino acid chain. Um, and this is done in the endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum, which is where most of the ribosomes live inside the cell. Uh, that's not particularly important other than it's not happening in the nucleus. So 
Um, translation works, so the way you would read this chart is the first base would be this m the middle of the circle. Your second base you would choose from the second ring of the circle, and then on the third ring of the circle you would get your last base. And then these are the monomers that compose proteins. There are a lot more of them now than four. Um, I used to know how many there were. I don't anymore. Does anybody have that information? Yeah. That sounds right. <laughs> right order of magnitude, at least. Um, and so some of these are actually redundant. Um, some of them are unique. Uh, every protein starts with a methionine, but not every transcript starts with a methionine. So this is ATG. Uh, fun fact, the unit that Patrick and Raymond and I were in is named ATGU, because ATG is the start codon. Um, and, but the transcripts don't necessarily start with a, a methionine. So you, you might have some, some dead RNA that the ribosome is just kind of like meh, reading. And then as soon as you get the first ATG, it starts turning it into protein. Uh, so there are also several stops in this diagram. They're represented by these black dots. Um, and there are three different ways to encode a stop. Uh, and those tend to be super relevant if you're trying to do sequence analysis on RNA. So note that sometimes changing one base does not result in an amino acid change, but sometimes it does result in a change, and specifically sometimes it results in a stop, which is exactly addressing uh, Grant's question er earlier. Well, it's related <laughs> to Grant's question earlier. Um, so protein, as I was saying, gets very complicated. Uh, proteins can, are chains of single amino acids. These then very quickly form complicated three-dimensional structures. The, the sort of two easy ways of looking at this are a beta sheet and an alpha helix. Um, so is it flat or is it coiled? Um, and these have a number of different properties based um, largely relating to how fond or not fond of water they are, and that really influences how these things kind of coil up. Uh, they then have a complicated three-dimensional structure, and sometimes these three-dimensional structures uh, involve more than one amino acid chain. Uh, and so this is a picture of two chains coiled together, and then sometimes they also involve other molecules, so things that are not part of this biological machinery. Hemoglobin is a great example, it's heme group involves iron, uh, and so it's, it's a couple of protein chains twisted together, and then they hold an iron in the middle. Yeah? Um, this is a question from the previous slide. Is there a reason why um, there are multiple stop codons during one stop codon? Is there a reason? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's more by happenstance than it is by design. And, and I think in general, when we start talking about the why, I think that's where thinking about this as an evolutionary process will be really helpful. Because uh, there will certainly be other moments in my talks where folks will want to ask, but why do we do it that way? Uh, all right. So this is kind of going back to what I was saying before. The proteins are molecular machines. They're biologically functional in a bunch of ways. Uh, they can be enzymes, they can be structural components, things that give the cells the structure and the shape that they need to perform their function. Uh, antibodies, transport and storage, messengers like hormones, um, and many, many other functions. Uh, proteins are not the only things that can do things in cells, but they are absolutely critical to uh, biology happening in any way that we sort of recognize it. Um, this biological machines uh, idea came from uh, my postdoc mentor, Ben Neal, uh, who likes to provide vivid and colorful analogies. Um, but I find it very, very useful in thinking about how this works. Um, so these machines can function well. They can function poorly. They can malfunction. They cannot function at all. And so when we start talking about mutations that have certain consequences, often that's the mechanism by which we're talking about them. Um, when a machine is not present, its function is not carried out, which seems rather obvious, but um, yeah. So if you, for some reason, aren't making a protein, uh, that designated function doesn't happen. All right, so now we've completed our little chart. We went from DNA, which is 
one dimensional and relatively straightforward, RNA, which is really dynamic in its amounts and uh, transcript isoforms, and then to protein where things actually happen inside of the cell. Um, these were the, cell, the slides that I added at the last minute. Thank you, Dan and Grant to Tammy for accommodating my change. Um, but I couldn't leave without telling you that this is not always the way that biology works. Um, so central dogma um, has many nuances and exceptions. Again, the central dogma is really important for how people think about how biology is done. Uh, but the, there also exist RNAs that are never made into protein, and they do seem to be important. Um, long non-coding RNAs are the long ones. Uh, microRNAs are the super, super short ones. And we'll have one slide on each of those. Uh, and the regulation of transcription and translation depends on a lot of different factors. In some cases, this is well understood. And in other cases, it's not. Uh, so the annotations of all of these things are kept up to date by large consortia, um, human and model organisms. This is things like Xenopus, uh, Drosophila, mouse. Um, seek to catalog the locations and the sequences of all the genes, all the exons, and all the different transcripts. Um, and these annotations actually change quite frequently uh, the more data is processed and analyzed and aggregated into these central sort of data repositories. Uh, so just really quick, because I couldn't resist telling you about uh, link RNA and miRNA. So these are long transcripts that never actually make it to that final step, but they can still have important functions. This is just a really quick, nice cartoon about what those functions look like. Uh, here's a link RNA binding to a fully formed protein. Uh, and this is changing its function, changing its conformation, doing something to alter the way this protein functions. It can bind directly to mRNA. This can change the structure of the mRNA, make it easier or harder to translate. Um, and so changing its priority in the biological queue. There are small molecular weight compounds that um, also bound to link RNAs. This is a therapeutic approach. I should know this. Um, to at least one <laughs> disease, they can also bind to miRNAs, which we'll talk about on the next slide. They can bind to the DNA itself, either causing it to coil tighter, um, to stall out the translation, transcriptional machinery, um, and just in general alter how favorable it is to have a specific thing transcribed, and it could also bind to a single peptide. Yeah, Patrick. So, so, yes, I'm just trying to understand what you, what you is, is the idea here that this is sort of, that we talked about the central dogma where, you know, the only thing that RNA does is it, it's, it becomes the, protein, yeah. yeah. But this thing is it's kind of playing the role of the protein here, in, in terms of yes. changing the structure. And yeah, that, that it's a little modifier. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think there are any examples of long non-carding RNAs that could do something like an enzyme. They, they often have a very specific function, and it is to glom itself onto something, thereby changing that thing's function. Um, and then even simpler would be the microRNAs, which their, their primary function is to glom onto something and then muck up whatever it was doing. Um, there are some cancer therapies that work by this mechanism. Uh, I don't know much about them other than that they exist, um, but you can. Uh, repress translation. So you, if you get a little bit of double-stranded RNA in your cell, um, the ribosomes don't want to deal with it. Um, your antiviral immune system might attack that if it's long enough. Um, you can get, you can send it off to be degraded, um, and it can also bind to a variety of other things. Um, so that's my, my quick list of RNAs that, that don't ever end up as proteins. Yeah. Another question. Go ahead. So, uh, this says, can you elaborate on, on why these segments have many functions? Mm -hmm. I know that there's an ongoing discussion about how important they are. If I remember correctly, one argument is that they've undergone rapid mutations, and therefore they're not serving an important function. I'm not exactly sure if the, the non, oh, tell me the non-coding DNA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure we've all heard the expression junk DNA. Right, that such a small proportion of our genome is coding, and therefore the rest of it must be junk. Um, it, it certainly does seem that less and less of it is junk. Uh, about the the long non coding RNAs, is the question specifically? So, so specifically, this is just any non coding DNA. So gotcha. Okay. So 
Yeah, uh, I, th I think the, the person asking the question is completely right. Uh, there is a lot of ongoing discussion about how important it is. I think that will remain to be seen in future decades. Uh, but it is becoming clear that there are places where it can be important. Um, these little RNAs that, that can regulate things is definitely one of those places. Uh, and then actually my last example is talking about another one. Um, and this is, this is showing it all kind of in the same region of, of the chromosome, but it's, it's turning out that these, these modifying elements can actually exist quite far away from genes. Um, and so we don't know where all these guys are. Um, so th just to tell you what the, is on this slide, um, regulatory regions in the genome. So it's, it's very common to have an enhancer, a silencer, a promoter region on the borders of a gene. And so these are special sequences that might recruit transcriptional machinery. Uh, these are sequences that, that basically tell the things that make the translation happen where to land. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on in the non-coding DNA. Is that addressing the question, or have yeah, I missed a piece? It sounds like you, yeah, so just saying, so you also just wanted to know your, your perspective. My perspective. On why they're important. Is it just you see examples of it, or is there other, other reasons why you think it's I, I guess I'm going to sound like an astronaut, but like, I think it, it, it exists, and we don't know what it does. So <laughs> it's, it's important to know that, it, that it's out there and that it might be important as we analyze our data and craft hypotheses and, and try to get closer to causality. Grant. But also, presumably, we might find a lot of gene loss hits in these companies. Uh, we sure do. Can that help guide the interpretation of what they do? It, it certainly has been used in that way. So, so that's a great answer. Um, Just repeat the, repeat the question. Oh, yes. Uh, Grant's question was also that if, as we get GWAS hits in these non-coding segments of the DNA, what do we make of them? If it doesn't code for a protein, what the heck do I do with it? Um, and if it encodes for a long non-coding RNA or a microRNA, obviously that would, that would be suggestive that, that it has a, some function in there. There are also um, SNPs that tend to fall in these kind of upstream of a gene locations, and at least in the GWAS that I've seen, that we get an abundance of hits in these sort of intergenic regions. Um, and, and so sometimes locality is used to infer a causal relationship or, or some kind of association between, say, the gene that's encoded here and the SNP that lives here, um, though that often at least on, a, on the biology side, requires substantial follow-up to demonstrate the causality. Paige. Can you repeat the difference between an enhancer and a promoter? Oh, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, this is, this is kind of where I tap out on molecular biology expertise. Um, but enhancers and silencers uh, recruit different, different molecular players than um, the promoters. I think the promoters tend to recruit transcriptional machinery, um, and the enhancers and silencers tend to recruit more structural okay. things, um, loosely. All right. So coming back from that quick diversion, um, if we're diving deeper into the genes and, and what it means when we start talking about what it, what it means to be a gene, um, we have this information repeatedly. Um, and so we have a transcription start site where the ribosome starts, uh, or where the translation, transcription, too many T words, transcription machinery attaches to the DNA and starts making uh, a messenger RNA. That is not always the start of the first exon. You have these long, you can have long or short untranscribed regions on both sides. Um, you read through, you include your exons and your introns, and you might have a stop at some point. Again, not always right at the end of the last exon. In fact, usually not. So um, if you have an mRNA, this, um, and you have a start code on here, and you have a stop code on here, you will end up with a protein that encodes this bit. Um, so this is, this is just kind of acquainting or orienting us to the scale of this kind of thing. Um, there are approximately 21,000 coding genes. This is about 1% of the human genome. It's kind of getting at the, the Zoom question. 
um, and expanding the definition of gene to include sequences that are transcribed but not translated, you end up with something like 56,000 genes. And as somebody who works on RNA-seq data, um, this difference can be substantial in compute time. Uh, the annotated genes are always described by a chromosome and a start and an end uh, and a strand. Uh, and this is also super annoying, uh, is that annotated genes can overlap. So if you have the positive strand going this way and the negative strand going this way, you can actually have one gene going this way and one gene going this way. Um, and sometimes the exons line up and sometimes they don't. Uh, and this can get quite confusing, especially if you get a GWAS hit in here, you're not sure which gene you've found. Yeah, Ted. Can there ever be like nested parentheses where there's like two starts and then like a stop and then like later on a second stop? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, that happens all the time. That's got to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm, hey, so if you, have, if you have different genes on, on the two strands, mm -hmm. is the implication that that RNA polymerase can read in both directions or like? Yeah, so, so you could get an RNA polymerase reading this way, you could get one reading that way. Um, probably don't want them active at the same time. Um, but it also means that if this region is open, that you're probably getting some transcription of both. Do they show preference from one direction or the other? That's a really good question, I don't know. All right, so typo. Sorry. Um, UCSC, so this is University of California at Santa Cruz, uh, has uh, launched a genome browser that's been a very useful tool uh, for this type of research and visualizing your genes, where they are, where the exons are, um, and how many isoforms you have. This is still well maintained. If you go to UCSC genome browser and you put in the name of your favorite gene, you can get annotation about what that gene does, if there is any. And you can also see it sitting in a chromosome, which is super fun. Um, this is one of the hits from the schizophrenia GWAS that came out when I joined Ben's lab, uh, Cacna 1i, which is a ion transporter in the brain. So, this is just like a quick timeline of kind of how this works. Um, so ENCODE and GenCode were formed in 2003. This is the same year that the, debatably, the Human Genome <laughs> Project declared completion. Uh, and so this is, this is the beginning of that effort to kind of standardize all of these annotations and to get us all on the same page as we talk about this. Um, the first GenCode releases happened in around 2005. Uh, the GenCode Project then scaled up in 2007. 2012, um, they published version 7, uh, and then they, this continues. This should be 2021 because this is still continuing to this day. Um, and while the builds of the human genome have slowed down slightly, the annotation in where the genes are, where the exons are, and what the transcripts are is still fairly active. Yeah. Uh, I had a question regarding like, the non-coding region. Yeah. So, so there are there are a couple of examples where that has been shown. I I think it's a little. Oh yes, right, the Zoom folks. Um, so Rubble's question was, are there instances where uh, a SNP that occurs far away from a gene in a non-coding region could impact the the expression of the of the gene and, and the one obvious example I know is the lactase one mutation, which is a single SNP, um, one of the lactase one mutations that's common in Europeans. So this this is what allows us to digest milk past babyhood. Um, most mammals can digest milk as infants, and then as we as we grow and we mature, we lose our ability to metabolize lactose sugars. Uh, and so there there is a mutation that occurred, and it is I think it's like megabases away from the actual lactose one gene, and it took a really long time to figure out what exactly was changing about the confirmation. Um, so, so there are some examples where that's true, but I think the inference gets very difficult. <laughs>
So if you have a SNP that's not previously been associated with anything before, it comes up in your GWAS and it's kind of in a gene desert. Which way you go and where you start associating is, is I think, the larger challenge. Does that address your question? Yes. Great. Uh, I also have a question about the rate of annotation progress. It's yeah. so cool just like that biology has done all this annotation work. If I'm reading like a GWAS from like 2015, mm -hmm. what are the odds, just in a real general sense, that there are oh, new yeah. annotations that they've discovered that aren't in the 2015 paper, you know, the progress we've made since the last six years in annotating more stuff? That's a great question. I would say it's conditional on what the 2015 paper says. So if the 2015 paper says it's in this gene, it's in an exon of this gene, it's protein coding, that probably hasn't changed because they don't tend to take those things back. Um, I'm sure it's happened, but, but that doesn't tend to happen as often as, hey, we, didn't, we thought this was a non-coding RNA and it turns out it does make a protein. Or we thought this was a gene desert and it turns out it does make an RNA. Um, so if it's in a gene desert, I would definitely look it up if it was an interesting hit. Okay, I think we're gonna have a, a little bit of a gear shift uh, with the next slide. So any more questions on, on kind of human genome structure? Nope, okay. So uh, this was a shameless excuse to put my cats in the slides. <laughs> uh, so we've talked a lot about the genome and how it is largely similar between all of us. But uh, pumpkin is 18 pounds and orange and fluffy, uh, and Pever is eight pounds and gray and sleek, and they are both cats, they are both male cats. So obviously these differences have something to do with their genetics. Um, and so we're going to start talking about variation between cells in an individual organism, and we're also gonna start talking about variation between individuals. So as I said, we're gonna talk about variation between cells in an individual and then between individuals themselves. This is dealing with cells dividing within the same organism. I think sometimes we get a little, or at least I get a little bit mixed up between the two, so I'm, I'm clarifying that for myself as much as you. Uh, so mitosis is the process with, by which cells reproduce within the same organism. This is, this is also on the trivia. Um, so uh, cells exist normally in interphase, and as Patrick was mentioning before, that uh, the DNA is just kind of all there. Uh, the chromosomes are not paired up in any kind of spatial relationship, uh, and transcription and translation are, are happening as the cell lives its merry life. Um, in prophase, this is the very beginning of cellular reproduction, um, the chromosomes start to pair up. And this is what we were talking about before, where they kind of get tied together in the center, uh, at the centromere is this central location. Um, and metaphase, they sort of line up along a central axis in these two poles is where the two daughter cells are going to result. Uh, notice this is where the pairing is really important. And we were talking about X and Y Somebody asked me about X and Y. Was that you? Okay. Um, that like this is this is where that that region of X and Y kind of matching and being able to tie them together is really important. Uh, here not so much, but here it super matters. Um, and so in metaphase, you get this kind of lining up. The cell is is performing a bunch of checks to make sure like okay, do we have two of chromosome nine? Do we have two of, of chromosome ten? Um, they do not line up in order, uh, according to size but the, the cell does have some mechanisms to check that you have all of them. Um, and then the cell begins to pinch off uh, two different cells. Uh, oh, I animated this, I forgot that. Um, and then you have telophase where you actually end up having two separate cells. Uh, so in this piece is where the DNA actually gets copied. And so when we talk about DNA replication, we're actually gonna talk about just this first step, and then all of this stuff is just gonna be kind of assumed. So DNA replication, this is another complicated figure. I'm gonna see if I can walk us through it um, somewhat reasonably. So I think the most reasonable place to start is the topo isomerase is kind of like the zipper. It unzips the two strands of DNA. And because we wanna now make two copies of what we had only one copy of before, um, this guy is unzipping things and then the new strand is being synthesized very similarly to the way we talked about making RNA where we're just matching 
the bases, and this is going to proceed five prime to three prime following the topoisomerase. This is called the leading strand because it's really pretty straightforward for the cell to do this, right? Uh, the pole delta can just follow the isomerase uh, and do the same thing. Um, whereas on the other strand, it's, it's kind of going the wrong direction. So this guy um, actually goes in the other direction, and so it's, it's done in pieces. And so you, you would go, it's called the lagging strand, uh, and you would, you would do a little chunk, and then, and then another molecule would come along, um, undo a chunk, and hopefully they all sort of line up. Um, and so the leading strand is often faster than the lagging strand, because there's just more going on here. Um, so this process, is yeah. One more error prone that's a great question. I was looking for that when I was making these slides, and I didn't actually find an answer to that question. Perhaps we can do some Googling or phone searching uh, at the break. So this whole process, Patrick mentioned errors. Oh, was there another question? Uh, yeah. I think I'm going to punt on that question. Uh, a lot of different things. Um, so obviously, during human development, um, there's there's just like all of the work in developmental biology talking about what regulates the rapid cell division that goes on there and the differentiation. Um, but in general, cells need to replace themselves, right? Like your skin needs to replace itself, um, blood, like, like simple things like that. Uh, Neurons, for example, reproduce much more rarely. Some of them don't reproduce at all. Uh, yeah? When the cell divides, are all the organ parts copied as well as the DNA? That's a great question. I, I'm not sure. But because we have a complete copy of DNA in both of the daughter cells, in theory, they, they yeah. should be able to regenerate and somehow know that they need to do that. I have one yeah. more question. Go for it. So if you go back a slide. So um, in this, if it, this is mitosis, then there's no reason that the, the X and the Y would need to pair, right? Like you just need the two copies of the... Oh, yes. You're totally right. I misspoke. Oh. <laughs> that was my bad. Yeah. This is just... Oh, yeah. Patrick was saying that X and Y wouldn't need to pair here because yeah. if it's inside of the body of a male individual, you want to keep X and Y in both the daughter cells. You have two Ys before it splits. Yeah, so you had two Ys, and then, so you, you just need to match them up. That's a really good point. That was totally my mistake. I will come back to that point when we talk about meiosis. Uh, all right, so somatic mutations. So when this machinery makes a mistake, and all of these machines can make mistakes, um, if this machinery makes a mistake now, um, you could mismatch a base, you could skip one or more bases, you could add some extra, uh, you could slip and then accidentally copy the same thing again, um, you could slip and skip something. Um, and then you could also have the situation where whole chromosomes are duplicated or missing. Usually the cell division checkpoints will catch this and either kill the cell or uh, ab abort the, the cell division, uh, but a somatic mutation is a change in the daughter cell's genome from the original parent cell. And most mutations are denied, are completely benign, so you, you wouldn't notice that this has happened. And in fact, in humans, this does happen, and if you fully sequence a whole bunch of cells from the same person, you will find that this has probably happened in each and every one of us. So here's another cat picture. This is not my cat, um, but this this demonstrates an example of one such mutation encoding fur color uh, early in development. So this cat, at some, at some point in differentiating between the left and right side, um, there was a mutation in one of the cat's uh, genes encoding fur color. And so this black cat has half of a gray face. And this is, this is one example of like how you can see this in real life. Uh, the other perhaps more serious obvious example of somatic mutation is in cancer. Uh, so if for some reason one of the genes regulating mitosis, so how quickly the, the cells can divide and how carefully checked they are, uh, has one of these errors and it 
impedes the function of, of the resulting protein, um, you can get unchecked cell division resulting in cancer. And so cancer cells proliferate in an uncontrolled way. And I am not an expert on the cancer genome, but there are people who are. Um, and you can observe that DNA replication gets very messed up in cancer. Um, and the cells allow it to continue because, all, because one or more of these checks have been disabled. So as we were talking about before, um, these are types of somatic variation. And, and these tend to have, have names. And this will, we normally talk about them in the context of inherited variation, but they exist here as well. So if you have a single base pair substitution, uh, this would result in a SNP if you have um, an insertion or a deletion, you would call it an indel. You could have that kind of slipping where you have multiple copies of the same region, uh, which we would call a copy number variance or a CNV. Uh, and you could get an extra copy or be missing a copy of a whole chromosome. For example, chromosome 13. Um, if this happens in the germline cells, this results in Down syndrome. Uh, but if it happens somatically, it most likely is either tolerated or not, um, depending on the cell and its function. So um, it's worth mentioning that most mutations are benign, um, and so often we call them variants. Uh, and even as you look at differences between cells in the same organism, you can find variants uh, often and can often uh, create kind of a, a tree of origin for all the cells in the body. And you can see where different mutations occur and which branches they, they propagate through, which is pretty cool. So meiosis, the thing that we care about probably more for the purposes of this workshop. Um, so meiosis 1 is very, very similar to regular old uh, DNA replication with one exception. So the chromosomes replicate. Uh, but they also engage in this process called crossing over. Yes, that's what I have next. So homologous chromosomes end up getting aligned. Um, so say this is chromosome 8. Uh, we have your maternal copy and your paternal copy of chromosome 8. And then this, these two pairs actually end up all getting together, and they start exchanging information. And so this is how we end up with say, one copy of chromosome 8 from our father, but it is not the exact copy of our paternal grandmother or paternal grandfather. Um, but they kind of get mixed together at this stage. And so this is what we would call recombinant, recombinant chromatids, uh, where most of the chromosome is from one, one parent, uh, but you have a little bit from another. And this is, this is an oversimplified cartoon. Some chromosomes will cross over multiple times. Uh, and, and so it can get quite complicated. Um, so this is the process by which the mat maternal and paternal chromosomes are kind of shuffled. Um, note this doesn't change the information. It does not change. Uh, it doesn't change the ploidy, but it does change what occurs with what. Dan. I have a question about the three-dimensional geometry. Yeah. The previous page. So the way this is shown here, they're, they're next to each other, and it's mm -hmm. like just the ones that are adjacent kind of crossed over. I, I think it's more like a cluster, yeah. All, all the combinations, yeah. So it's all the combinations, not just, it's, it's the, the, like the, there's one, two, three, and four for the, if I'm numbering the mm -hmm. chromosomes. Um, like blue, blue, red, red. Yeah. Yeah. So then one of the blues could cross over with both of the reds. Hmm. If it was on different arms, maybe. Like, you could get a crossover event here and then there, but probably not here and there. It's, it's very spatially dependent, and this is not my area of expertise, but that's my understanding of it. Oh, yeah. Um, is there a difference in the frequency of crossing over between different areas of the chromosome? So, if it's Uh, there, there is absolutely a correlation to the location. It's not quite that simple, uh, but that, I couldn't have asked for a better transition. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about recombination and just giving a definition, um, but this does occur more frequently in hotspots. 
So this is things that have been commonly known as recombination hotspots uh, for a couple of generations of scientists now. Um, and those hotspots are determined by a variety of factors, but it doesn't seem to be um, proximity to the centromere necessarily. Um, so on average, things will recombine uh, approximately once per chromosome. It's slightly higher in females than males, but as we were just talking about, double recombination events do happen. Um, they're just not quite as common. Yeah? Are there cases of zero recombination events? Yes. But again, each chromosome does this separately. So even if you have all of chromosome six from maternal grandmother, um, that probably won't be true for the rest of your chromosomes. Yes? Is there any working theory for why recombination is higher in females? <clears throat> That's a great question. I'm sure there is, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah. So, like, after recombination, I feel like segments of, like, a given chromosome, like, is crossed over, right? So, mm -hmm. do you say, like, a really, like, uh, important, like, part of the genome is Gotcha. Okay. So I think it's important to remember here that no, no crucial. Oh yes. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, the question was: in this process of crossing over, do we lose any vital information? Is that an accurate representation? Um, okay. So, so it's important to remember that this is your two copies of the same chromosome from your mom and the same one from your dad. So they encode the same functional bits. Um, so the same genes are represented here and here. Um, you may have variants, so say this is, this is kind of how like a recessive variant might work. Um, is like if you have one functional copy and you have one non-functional copy, um, as long as you get one, as long as the, the zygote gets one, you're fine. Um, but in general, we're not, we haven't lost any information. We've just kind of switched up which version of the genes travels with which. So the question is, like, if, like, two arms, so we, if the combination is happening in both arms, mm -hmm. is, is there a possibility of losing? Of losing something? I, not a large possibility. Like, again, you, you have two living grandparents on, on each side, right? So they each have functional chromosomes that they pass down to your parent. Um, which then pass down a functional copy to you. So all of these should be functional by barring any major somatic mutations. Yeah. yeah. Just to follow up on that, do insertions and deletions have to do anything with recombination? Like is that gonna do gotcha. uh, so so the question the question was uh, do insertions and deletions and other forms of uh, mutation happen during this process of crossing over. My understanding is not really, um, but those things can still happen in this replication phase, where if, if the errors tend to happen when we're making copies. Does that help? Cool. Oh, man, there's a bunch of you. Dan. So it's crucial for our purposes, we want to assume that, that, that these events are random. Um, mm -hmm. Do we know how the cell, how, how the Biologically, that randomness is, is implemented? I don't. We humanity might, um, <laughs> but, but I don't. Um, it is absolutely measurable. And you certainly see it in things like linkage disequilibrium, which we will talk about in one of the later lectures. Um, the, just that, that kind of frequency of crossing over and two variants getting, getting separated and put back together versus um, always traveling together. So right. I, I have a bit of a hard time reconciling that with the notion of a recombination hotspot. Gotcha. Um, you have trouble recognizing, reconciling. Like if, if recombination is happening randomly, but there are also hotspots where it's more likely to happen. Ah, uh, OK. Um, it's, it's randomly in terms of which chromosome recombines with which. Um, and it's relatively random in terms of which hotspot you get. So it's not like you have one hotspot per chromosome. Um, 
and they roughly correspond with the LD blocks. Okay. So, so I was taught to think about it. Um, if I draw on the whiteboard, am I still going to be visible? Um, we don't happen to have a marker, do we? Oh my gosh, we do. Okay, um, so that. Gotcha. All right. I'm totally gonna mess this up, aren't I? All right. Well, while that's thinking, um, that like, say that this is an LD block, and this is an LD block. That they're they're kind of like, like opportunities. To, to combine that, that you might have like this. But even if you were going to get a recombination on this chromosome, you could have had this one or you could have had this one. And then this is fairly long. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are multiple sites where it could happen. Yes. And the selection of which site is actually going to happen is like approximately random. Is that? Th that's, that's the way it's often modeled, yes. But they don't, it doesn't always happen in multiple sites, right? Right. So anyway, yeah, so, so the hotspots are, are not a binary classification. It's, it's not your, yes, you are a hotspot, or no, you're not. It's, it's a probability distribution. And even in places where it's relatively unlikely to get a recombination, it still can happen and does. And that's how we determine things like genetic distance. And, and you know, so one in 100 crossovers means it, it still happened. OK. We talked about recombination. Meiosis two. Great. Okay. So um, in meiosis two, we actually end up making. So we've already divided once. So now we have one complete copy um, of the genome, but the chromosomes have been kind of scrambled in a way that we still preserve all the information that we wanted to have. Uh, but we have them kind of scrambled up so that the grand parental chromosomes are not segregating together anymore. Um, and so then the cell divides again. And this time it separates the pairs. And this is where pairing X and Y is important, not where I said it was before. Um, and so now we end up with two haploid cells, one with each with one copy. Um, and if we put this all on one slide and borrow a picture from another textbook, um, you can see that in males, this results in the creation of four sperm, each of them with a complete haploid copy of the human genome, uh, though different recombined versions of the parental genome. Um, and in females, this results in the creation of one egg cell and then three polar bodies. And so, so the ratio of gamete creation is, is not equal here. Uh, so germline mutations, which is what we'll spend most of our time thinking about uh, as we think about things like GWAS and, and measuring lots of different people, um, as in mitosis, mistakes or, or copying errors can happen here. Um, I'm going to have to think of a better way to describe them than errors. Um, but again, we have all the same options that we had before. Um, and when a mutation happens in the germline, it can be inherited. Uh, whereas if you have, say, a mutation in a skin cell, that will not be inherited. Uh, and these are called de novo mutations. So if that is, if you are the parent of origin for one of these mutations, this is what people refer to when they talk about de novo. And again, most of the time, this is benign. And so we often talk about these as variants. But once one of these has happened, it can be passed down to all subsequent generations. Yeah. Yeah. It is. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So so the oocytes will have um, will have mitochondria. The sperm are really small, um, and the DNA has to be packed really really carefully um, in order to make that whole process work. Like they have to travel, um, and, and they have to be really, really tightly packed. Um, fun fact is that um, sperm, sperm are also strip away all of the regulatory um, kind of structural 
proteins from the DNA. So if you look at um, mRNA expression, um, the testes tend to express everything because there's nothing regulating mRNA production. Um, and it took us a while to figure out why that is in looking at messenger RNA data. So yes, um, no mitochondria from the sperm, but you do get the mitochondria from the eggs, which is why the offspring will only have maternally inherited mitochondria. Yeah. Is it transcribed? Yeah. Um, it's got a couple genes. You mostly involved in the function of the mitochondria. All right, so we talked about this. Uh, this is the same slide I showed before, but now um, when we apply this to germline mutations, this gets a whole lot more interesting because now we can start talking about how different humans are related to each other. Um, this kind of variation, most CNVs are, are tolerated to a point until they get very long. Um, fragile X syndrome is, a, is an example of where that gets very, very long. Um, and then the cells have difficulty dividing. Um, trisomies are possible uh, for some chromosomes and not others. So trisomy 13 results in Down syndrome in humans. Um, but they tries. I thought it was 13. I think you can have a trisomy 21, though. Patel syndrome is, is 13. I got them mixed up. So de novo mutations then can be passed down. Um, so the base rate of substitution, if we're talking about one base at a time, uh, is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 9. This is the rate of new mutations in humans, uh, and it's pretty low. But once a variant is inherited, it can be passed on. So if we look at a variant that, say, happened in this individual here, and we want to see who is inheriting it, um, you can start to see those things propagating down through generations, which is the business that we're all in. Um, this is a pedigree diagram. We'll talk a lot about those today and tomorrow. Um, just to give everybody kind of a crash course on how to read this, um, the squares represent male individuals, and the circles represent female individuals. Uh, a line between them means a mated pair, and then these are their offspring. Uh, we'll talk more about that after lunch. Uh, but uh, de novo mutations over time, over many generations, become population variants. And so this is a figure that kind of depicting theoretical human evolution. Uh, and so this is modern human origins, um, population divergence as, as people moved out of Africa to settle the rest of the world. Um, and you can see that as we take these, vari these variations that have accumulated over the generations in aggregate, we can start to construct um, a common family tree for all humans. And I think um, we're nearing the end of, of kind of this idea, um, but you can imagine that this could also explain differences in species if we zoom out quite a bit um, and start talking about this on the scale of millions of years, that we can start talking about our relationships to um, the other great apes and to the other primates. So in summary, we've talked about a basic definition of a cell, we've talked about DNA, we've talked about structure of the human genome. We've talked about the central dogma, which is important, but not the only way that things happen in cells. Uh, and then we've introduced genetic mutations and variation. Uh, we are almost at lunchtime, but I'm happy to take any more questions or discussion as we want. Um, uh, in the phenotype mutation chart, what's with the divergence? Yeah. Dotted line between, oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so, so I think this indicates migration. Uh, and, and migration, uh, for the zoomies, the, the question was, what is this dotted line here between uh, Asia and Australia, Malaysia? Uh, the idea being that um, our understanding of human migration historically is that everybody moved uh, out, out from Sub-Saharan Africa. So to the rest of the continent um, on Afri in Africa, but also to Europe and the Middle East and Asia. Um, and that these are large migration events that anthropologists and archaeologists 
spend a lot of time thinking about exactly the how and the when, um, and those theories change every decade or so. Uh, but but it is clear that native First Nations peoples in the Americas and many of the original inhabitants of um, Australia and Melanesia came from the Asian continent originally. I don't actually know what these horizontal lines refer to. So it's not supposed to be different from the original people in Austro-Melanesia, is it? That's sort of implying there was just divergence, and then there Here, was some and then there was another. I don't, I don't, is that true? I don't know. I, d I don't know if, if current data is pointing that way. This is not a field I keep close, close tabs on. So if somebody does, <laughs> please chime in. Grant. Uh, this is this is from a while back, so there's no need to go back to the slide. But um, when the intro is sliced out of the gene, mm -hmm. um, is it immediately degraded, or is that moonlighting as some regular? Oh, that's a really good question. My understanding is mm -hmm. that they're immediately degraded okay. because they're small, basically nonsensical pieces of single-stranded RNA, and there are a lot of different mechanisms in the cell. Like, and I wonder if because I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah that is like a little loop. Oh, I don't, I don't think they actually fasten the ends oh. of, of the intranet. It creates that, that lariat structure because that's how, that's how the splicing the two exons happens. I see, I see. Um, but I, I don't think the, in fact, I'm fairly sure that the resulting intron that floats away is, is not a loop. Okay. Yeah. How much of what you've talked about today is specific to human reproduction? Oh, that's a great question. I have to think about what I've talked about today. Uh, so the number and the shapes of the chromosomes in this diagram is specific to humans, but the principles are still the same uh, in mammals, so all the way to mice and rodents, uh, would still be true of zebrafish and drosophila. It might be different in some ways, but conceptually similar in plants. Uh, let's see, what else we talk about? Uh, meiosis. Some plants reproduce sexually, some of them don't, so it depends. But for all the animals, this concept still applies. Uh, somatic mutations happen in anything that cell divides, so not human-specific at all. Um, I use a lot of cat examples, I'm learning. <laughs> um, and then obviously this is human genome-specific, yeah. and there are other genomes in here. You should check them out. Um, mostly model organisms and higher primates. But it's getting more diverse. There, there's remarkably many species in here now. Cool. Anything else? Great. Let's eat, eat some lunch. Mm -hmm.